Okay, so I'm going to talk about human trafficking, modern slavery, and I'm going to uh, basically uh, kind of apply it to the private sector. But to begin with, I'm going to start off with kind of an overview of what is modern slavery and human trafficking in its most holistic sense. And I'm going to talk about how the private sector got involved, talk a little bit about manufacturing, about to the banking industry, and then I'll end with some uh, kind of inspirational suggestions that people can use in order to kind of move forward. But to begin with, when most people think about human trafficking, they think about the top left-hand photo for good reason. There are 6.3 million women in forced prostitution around the world. My first exposure to this was 35 years ago. I was living and working in Nepal. I was a public health officer working for the US government, supporting the government of Nepal, and I had the HIV AIDS portfolio. My job was basically to translate resources into healthier people. At that time, we were finding girls 12, 13 years old who were HIV positive. We couldn't understand what was going on. This is a very conservative culture. So we went to go and talk to the women and the girls in the shelters, and we heard pretty much the same story over and over again. And it went something like this. Human trafficker, guy around 20 years old, would go into a remote village, flash a bunch of money around, say, I'm looking for a wife. I don't want an urban wife. I want a village wife. He'd find a girl 12 years old, befriend her, go to the family and say, I'd like to marry your daughter. They're thinking, wow, he's rich. He's handsome. He's going to take care of our daughter. He's going to take care of us. In that part of the world, it's quite common to get married at that age. After a couple of weeks, they actually have a wedding ceremony. The entire community is there. After the wedding, he goes to the family and says, I'm going to take your daughter to Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, but don't worry, I'll be back in three months. But that isn't what's going to happen. Instead, he takes her to Mumbai, India, to the red light district where the brothels are. Now, this girl's never been more than 20 kilometers away from her, her home. And so when she's in India, she thinks she's still in Nepal. When he gets there, he puts her in a room and he says, honey, stay here. I'll be back in a few minutes. As she was coming to this place, she saw these women dressed funny, these men milling around. She says, no, 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 don't leave me. I'm scared. He says, it's OK, I'll be right back. He then goes to the madam to get the 500 US dollars for having sold her to the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding and he hands the wedding pictures over to her. He then leaves to go back to Nepal to do this again, maybe 40, 50 times in a year. The madam then goes into the room where the girl is and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me, and you're going to be with 20 guys a day every day because I say so. You can imagine this girl shocked. No, 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 no. My husband loves me. We just got married. No, that's what happened. When many of these girls internalize what's happening, they often say, I will kill myself before I do those shameful things. I'm a good Hindu girl. Madam then brings out the photograph of the wedding and says, this is your mother, your father, your brother. If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in this situation. In order to make her into a prostitute, it's quite simple. You simply shame her. So they bring in a couple of professional rapists. And over a two-day period of time, they take this 12-year-old girl, rape her 10, 12, 15 times, until eventually she just lays back and accepts whatever happens to her. After that, she's put on the line. She will be with 20 guys a day, every day, until after a couple of years, she gets what's called black eye, where she's so depleted physically and emotionally and spiritually, nobody wants her, so they throw her out onto the street. Many of them languish in India and die of AIDS. Some of them get back to Nepal. And those were the girls that I was talking to. But I didn't understand the evil of this until I actually went to those brothels. I was invited by the Indian government to do public health checks. I went into the brothels with a police officer, went into one of them, and there was an 11-year-old trafficking victim. This girl saw this Caucasian guy, saw an opportunity, literally ran up, wrapped herself around me and said, save me, save me. They're doing terrible things to me. As I looked down at this child who was hysterically crying, I turned to the police officer and said, we need to get this girl out of here. He said, we can't do that. So what are you talking about? You're a cop. He says, if we try to leave, we'll both be killed. To make a long story short, we left. We came back with a lot more police, but of course she was gone. Now, I tell this story because I wasn't one of those 15-year-olds that said, when I grow up, I want to be an activist. In fact, I did everything I could not to be one. But every once in a while in life, we're tested. It was my big test. I should have helped that girl. And when I look back, I can think of a dozen things I could have done, but I didn't. And I was haunted by that. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And eventually did what a lot of activists do in this particular regard, surrender to the fact that now that I know about this, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And 35 years later, here I am talking to you. 
But it's not just women and girls, it's men and boys. Top right-hand photo, this is a fishing boat in Thailand. Story behind this, 15-year-old boy from Cambodia is told by his family, you gotta go down to Thailand. You gotta go and work on a, uh, in, a, in a factory or in a farm or someplace because we're poor and you need to send money back to us. So the guy's by himself in, the, in uh, Thailand looking for work, not finding it. Human traffickers see this, go up to him and say, hey brother, looks like you need some help. Let me lend you some money. Okay, well, now that you have my money, you have to stay with me. But guess what? I got this great job. I'm going to take you down to the ocean. I'm going to put you on a boat. The boat will go out for a couple of months. You'll catch some fish. Uh, you know, you guy, guys love fishing, right? After that, the boat will come back. They'll give you lots of money. You'll be a hero to your family. So they go down to the ocean. He gets on the boat. The boat goes out, but it doesn't come back after three months. It stays out for four years. This poor kid will end up working 14, 15, 16 hours a day, every day. If he doesn't, he gets beaten. He gets tortured. The only food he'll eat the entire time he's there is rice and fish, nothing nutritious. Imagine what that will do to his body. In order to get him to work hard, they give stimulants. So he's constantly on these uh, these stimulant drugs. If he gets sick, if he gets injured, they just throw him off the side of the boat. At the end of the four years, the boat comes in. The guy goes to the captain and says, give me something. The captain says, go away. You're illegal in my country. The guy says, I'm going to tell the police. The captain laughs and says, go ahead. We own the police. Another example of human trafficking. Bottom center photo, uh, sweatshops. I lived and worked in Thailand for six years. And during the time that I was there, there was all kinds of raids and rescues that uh, the our, my United Nations office would oversee. Story behind this, person from Myanmar hears that there's work in a place called Sumit Sakan. There's about 4,500 seafood packing companies down there. Person goes down there. Knocks on the door of one of the factories. Factory owner comes out and says, well, what do you need? Guy says, I'm looking for a job. Factory owner says, okay, I'll give you a job. I'll pay you the equivalent of 50 US dollars a month in local currency. But if you take this job, you have to stay in the factory. You can't leave. This guy's never made more than $25. He's thrilled. He accepts the job, works under terrible conditions. But at least in the back of his mind, he's thinking, I'm going to be able to send this money home. After a couple of months, he goes to the manager and says, I'd like to be paid. Manager says, well, you know, I forgot to mention one thing. For you to be here in this factory with room and board and food and everything cost me $54. I'm only paying you $50. Guess what? You owe me money and you can't leave until you pay it back. So there's nine foot walls, barbed wire, closed circuit TV, security. Once a month, they will basically take one of these people to the back, beat them until they're bloody, take a photograph of this, show everybody to say, if you try to leave, this will happen not only to you, but to your family as well. These are all examples of what we call modern slavery, human trafficking. To just give you a couple of variations on this theme. Um, so I was recently in Singapore and I presented to a pharmaceutical company. And, you know, they're a very sophisticated company with, you know, a very high value kind of supply chain. At the end of the presentation, they came to me and said, well, you know, with all due respect, thank you for that talk. But we don't really feel like we have any concerns about this. You know, we're a very sophisticated company. So I asked them, well, how do you get your products from the warehouse to the pharmacies, third-party contractors? I said, did you ever look into them? No. Two weeks later, I got a call from them and they said, well, we looked into it and we came to realize that those people were being highly exploited. Can you help us out? I made a presentation also in Singapore and um, it was to a law firm. Law firm says, well, we don't have supply chains. We don't have any issues or problems or anything related to this. Thank you very much for your presentation. I asked them, well, who cleans your building? They said they didn't know. Two weeks later, we get a call and they said that they found out that the Bangladeshis that were being uh, cleaning their rooms were in a highly exploitative situation. So the point I'm making is that if you shine a light in all different directions, if human beings can find a way of taking advantage of other human beings, they're going to do it. So there's all kinds of human trafficking type situations that we often don't see. Another type of human trafficking that you may not see in the different parts of the world that you're in is human trafficking into scam centers. A couple of years ago, when COVID hit, a lot of the criminals in this part of the world couldn't go and do the usual rape and pillaging that they usually did. And so they recognized that if they went online and asked people for money and lied about it, every 10th person would give them money. So they decided that they were going to try to hire a bunch of Asian people to scam other people. But Asian people don't want to uh, scam other Asian people. So they started to traffic them to Cambodia and Myanmar. According to the United Nations, about 250,000 young people, educated people, 
uh, are in these scam centers. They work 14, 15 hours a day. If they don't meet their target, they get beaten, tasered, terrible things happen to them. What this demonstrates is that like anything else, there are uh, mutations and evolutions of different types of crimes. In this particular case, you have the human trafficking to a scam center and scamming that have combined into one particular type of crime. And this is the, uh, kind of another example of something that we're seeing in this part of the world and expect to see it in other parts of the world as well. So I've used the terminology human trafficking and modern slavery almost interchangeably. And there's a lot of kind of overlap here, but let me talk a little bit about the difference between them. In the United States, human trafficking is a ter terminology because there's a, a legal definition of it. The rest of the world is using modern slavery. So the reason why human trafficking was selected as the initial terminology 35 years ago was because many of the cases we saw had a person going from one country to another. And so uh, because they were going from one country to another and there was movement involved, they called it trafficking, like drug trafficking. Drugs go from one place to another, they're being sold or drug or arms trafficking. In this particular case, the commodity was human beings. But over time, people said, well, wait a minute, we see cross-border trafficking, but we also see trafficking within countries. A person goes from one district to another within a country or within a city, from one part of the city to the other and they get trafficked. What difference does it make how they get there? Shouldn't we focus on the exploitation? So when they were looking for a term that described how a person doesn't get paid and can't leave the situation, the word slavery came up over and over again. But because people think about slavery as happening a long time ago, they put the word modern next to it. So modern slavery is basically the outcome of the process, which is human trafficking, if you look at it that way. According to the statistics, there's about 50 million people in modern slavery. In fact, there are more slaves today than any other time in history. I'll say that again, it's worth noting. More slaves today than any other time in history. If I were to do this presentation eight months ago, the number would have been 40 million. But because of COVID, you saw tremendous desperation in different locations. So let's say that you had a Bangladeshi garment worker. She was making pretty good money. All of a sudden, COVID hits. What happens? The factory gets closed, not for a couple of days or weeks or months, but for years. In order to survive, she uses her savings up in order. When Once that's done, she starts borrowing money at high interest rates. When she can't pay that back, then the money lenders basically say, well, we need a family member. And that family member is going to end up working for a year or two in a fishing boat or a brothel or whatever. And so you see this desperation feeding modern slavery. In my part of the world, in Asia, about 55% of the victims are here, basically for two reasons. Number one, there's a lot of Asians. China, 1.4 billion people. India, 1.4 billion people. America, was it 320 million, 340 million? Look at the differences between these populations. Add Pakistan and Philippines and Indonesia, and you have a huge number of people. The second thing is the feudal systems that have allowed odd for you know exploitation to take place in this part of the world have never been completely dismantled. As a result, you see significant exploitation in the form of what we call human trafficking and modern slavery. When it comes to the women and children, about 71% of what we're talking about would fall into the category of women and children. 18% within that would be children. And like anything else, you see tremendous disparity. People who are from lower socioeconomic situations, people who are in flood situations, disaster situations, their crops are not growing situations, are often very vulnerable to this type of a crime taking place. And so, uh, once again, um, it's it's one of those uh, types of phenomena that tends to uh, kind of center around uh, people who are disenfranchised. When it comes to the exploitation rate, about 9.2 million people enter per year. That translates to about 25,000 people per day. In the time it takes me to do this presentation, about 1,000 people were a new slave every four seconds. So if I count to four, one, two, three, four, somewhere in the world, somebody's entering into modern slavery. It could be the US, it could be the UK, it could be Japan, Hong Kong, China. All over the world, we have people in these kind of a situation. When it comes to the age distribution, about a quarter of the cases would be children. Uh, the rest are adults. Most people think that human trafficking is predominantly forced prostitution. It only represents about a quarter of the case. The rest of the cases are forced labor cases. But this is where it comes back to us. 60% of the forced labor cases are associated with supply chains, where we get our phones and our clothes and our food and fish and so forth. The relevance of this is the same as the relevance to the environmental movement. When 
they were when uh, Al Gore and others were able to make the case that we as human beings are contributing to the carbon footprint, that was a turning point. And more people got involved in stepping up and uh, being a part of the solution. By us demonstrating that as consumers, we buy things and a certain percentage of what we buy is tainted by modern slavery, we can make the same case. We are contributing to the issue. I'll come back to that point a little bit later. When it comes to who's supposed to be addressing this issue, well, I've worked with over 40 governments around the world. Most governments don't like this topic, but some of them are embarrassed by it. Some of them basically just think it's a, a hassle. They don't know what the, to do with the victims. It's expensive. It's confusing. So a lot of governments do things, but usually not enough in order to make a significant difference. I worked for the United Nations for six years, ran the largest counter-trafficking program in the world for a while. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about the United Nations is that uh, while I was doing this work, uh, I spent much of my time in five-star hotels, eating really good food, debating and discussing human trafficking. Uh, it was very esoteric, it's very theoretical. So the groups that are really doing the work, the lion's share of the work would be the NGOs. They do the prevention, the prosecution, they go after the bad guys, they help the victims and so forth. But if we go back to the statistics, out of the 50 million people, 75% in forced labor, 60% associated with supply chains, here's another group that needs to be involved in this. This is the private sector. But if you think governments don't like this topic, the private sector hates it because they're often on the receiving end of somebody wagging a finger and basically saying, you guys are so greedy, you would knowingly use uh, slave labor in order to uh, have shareholder profits. Now, in reality, big companies around the world with esg and sustainability and corporate social responsibility and everything would do anything and everything they could to avoid exploitation because it's a huge reputational risk. But most consumers think that the private sector is inherently evil and they would do that. Once again, I'll come back to that point a little bit later as well. So what I'm going to show you now is the uh, report card for the number of people that were helped out of modern slavery last year with all of the United Nations governments and NGOs combined. And then I'm going to show you out of a half a million criminals around the world, how many of them actually went to jail. So think in your mind what a good number would be. And here are the here's the data. Last year, out of 50 million people, about 108,000, which is 0.2 percent, not even a half percent of these victims help. And remember those stories that I told you out of a half million criminals, about 6,000 of them convicted. That's 0.8 percent. Wow. When you look at this, you might ask the question, does the counter-trafficking world not care? Are we lazy? Are we not doing our job? That's really not the issue. Anyone who works in this sector like me, we desperately want to do something to address this issue, like you guys in the environmental mode, same type of thing. The issue is this, the profits generated from modern slavery, 150 billion US dollars a year, second only to drug trafficking, which is about $300 billion. The amount of money that's available to address this is about 350 million annually, or 0.23% of the profits. So huge profits and a very little amount of money used to be able to address this issue. To put that number into perspective, in the United States, we eat a lot of potato chips, $6 billion worth a year. It takes 21 days of potato chip eating in the United States to come up with the equivalent amount of money that is used globally to fight modern slavery you can see what it is that we're up against. Another thing is the scale. The number of do-gooder types like me around the world is about 30,000 people. We have to follow rules and regulations. We have to get donor permissions. We have to do progress reports. Everything we do has to be uh, uh, above board in uh, basically in a, in a positive way. If you're a criminal, you don't have to do any of those things. If anyone comes after your business, you mutate, you evolve, you change, you hurt somebody, whatever it takes to basically protect your business obviously an unfair advantage. The other thing is awareness. Uh, usually when I'm in, a, in front of a large crowd, I ask the question at this point, how many of you knew 25% of what I was talking about before I said it? Sometimes I get a couple of hands. Many times I don't get any hands at all. It's because a lot of people don't know about this topic. So if you don't know about human trafficking, you're not going to care about it. If you don't care about it, you're not going to do anything. And it's really not your fault. We in the counter-trafficking world haven't done a good enough job to sensitize people to this issue and to help people to understand it. Okay, so that's the beginning part of my presentation. To give you just kind of an overview of what is modern slavery and human trafficking, what I'm going to do now is shift gears and basically talk about the private sector and how the business world kind of got involved in this. 
So 10 years ago, you weren't having corporations, banks or manufacturers, the hospitality sector talking about this. This was an NGO bill, uh, issue. But now what you have is all those industries basically focusing on that. So what I'm going to do now is describe how did the private sector get involved in this effort? And a lot of it really comes down to that statistic of 0.2%. When governments and lawmakers came to realize that the NGOs and the United Nations and the governments weren't having much impact, but at the same time, you know, there were supply chains associated with this and supply chains are associated with the private sector. They said, well, we need to bring the business world into this. But because they felt like the only way for that to happen was to basically hit them over the head or create some type of a business risk, that's kind of the trend that we're seeing take place. So let me go through some of the things that are happening now. The first trend leads to legislation. So prior to 2012, you would periodically have corporations in the United Nations and governments getting together to talk about human rights and human trafficking. These are often conferences or, or committees or workshops and so forth. And they often resulted in some pretty good papers, a lot of panels and conferences and events and so forth. The outcome was good, but non-binding. You could use the materials or not, and most organizations didn't. The first legislation directly related to brands, to corporations specifically, was the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. That came out in 2012. Governor um, Schwarzenegger was the one who signed that, uh, the Terminator. Basically what that act said is that if you're a big company and you have $100 million in retail or management uh, uh, in uh, California, you have any products there at all, you have to put on your website what you're doing to address modern slavery. If you're not doing anything at all and you say that, you're in compliance, you've got to say something. A couple of years later, the UK Modern Slavery Act came, lowered it from $100 million to 36 million pounds, but they added two additional things. Number one, you have to have an annual report. It's about 20 pages, and that annual report has to be signed by the board of directors. Then you had the French had an act, and the Australians, and the Germans, and the Canadians have an act. What we're seeing is that with each of these acts, they add additional bells and whistles. So initially, it was just about a website posting, and then it was an annual report. Now, the German Act says that if you get caught with uh, forced labor in your supply chain, you're going to be fined and penalized. You have to have grievance mechanisms. Those grievance mechanisms have to go all the way down to the lowest level of your supply chains. So with each transparency legislation, companies have to basically retool and identify what they're doing or not doing to address modern slavery. Another thing we're seeing are class action lawsuits. Uh, the seafood industry gets sued on a regular basis. Um, uh, and, and part of it would be, let's say, a large retailer, a, a Costco or a Tesco or a Walmart were to buy seafood from Thailand. The plaintiffs would sue them and basically say, well, you're buying from a location that we know is tainted by modern slavery. By you doing that, you're actually supporting modern slavery. You need to use your influence to stop that. Now, in many cases, these, law, uh, these uh, lawsuits are not being won, but what happens is it gets into the social media or the traditional media, and as a result of that, it names and shames these organizations. It creates a huge reputational risk. And so this becomes a problem for large companies that are buying certain types of products. The chocolate industry gets sued on a regular basis because the cocoa beans come from different locations in Africa that have very little governance. We know that there are children involved. We know they're not being paid. Now, obviously, if the chocolate industry is being sued for modern slavery, that's a big problem. They want their products to be associated with Valentine's Day, with Easter, with birthdays, everything positive and good. The moment you put that word modern slavery next to it, it creates a huge reputational risk. So we see this, this trend taking place every once in a while. Another thing is increased media coverage. For the last 10 years, there's been almost a doubling every year of issues related to modern slavery. Now, those of you who are a little bit older probably remember in the 1990s, it was all about HIV AIDS. For 10 years, that's what people were talking about. And the reason for that was because people had that on their mind. When was the last time you saw or heard anything about HIV AIDS? Not for a long time. Not because it hasn't gotten any better. It hasn't. But because it moved over to something else. Climate change and global warming dominated for 15 years, and it continues to dominate. But a new emerging issue of our time is modern slavery and human trafficking. And so as a result of, of this emphasis, expect to see for a period of time more and more coverage, because the more coverage you put out there, the more appetite there is for additional coverage.
But other thing we're seeing is that there's NGOs that kind of go after big private companies. I'm not going to say what the company is, where the X's are, but this particular NGO will identify a company that has forced labor associated with it. And then they have a list of around four or five million people. And they'll say to each of those people, uh, send an email or a letter to this address, basically saying you're dissatisfied with this particular organization. And so these campaigns take place. It spills over into social media, creates all kinds of issues for the private sector. Now, imagine if you're like a compliance officer and you have a great weekend and you come in and all of a sudden you open up your email, and there's four million angry emails in there. Not a good day for that particular company. Another thing we see is an emphasis on ESG. Now, obviously, if you're working in the uh, environmental area, e, uh, e and G would be very much part of what you're focusing on. Those particular elements of um, ESG are, are very well established and they have metrics and they're quantitative and so forth. Uh, the S side is, is kind of the, uh, the forgotten cousin. Uh, a lot of organizations say there's not data related to, we, we can't uh, basically measure this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is changing. Uh, prior to COVID, you would see that a lot of companies would cherry pick the E and the G. Let's say that you're an electric car company. You would pick indicators in the E and G to indicate how awesome you are. Post-COVID, what we're seeing is that there's much more emphasis on making sure there's balance between all of these sectors. So if you're that electric car company and you have to put the S in there and your cobalt and lithium are coming from the Congo, all of a sudden your scores are going to go down. And so what we're seeing is that uh, and I had one government official in Canada basically say this that eventually ES will identify the naughty and the nice list. The naughty list will be those organizations that don't do anything in ESG or have low scores. The nice will be they have high scores in each of these particular categories. This seems to be the direction that, that they're going in. And the reason why this is relevant and important is because millennials care about this. You know, 80 per, 84% of a survey uh, done among the millennials indicated that they cared about ESG and they would make decisions uh, on investments related to that. This same constituent is kind of moving in the direction of uh, being the fund managers of the mutual funds and the retirement funds because their values will carry over. So what all of these things basically tell us is that the private sector is kind of kicking and screaming, brought into the discussion of modern slavery because if they don't do these things, something terrible could happen to them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of manufacturing to talk some of the, about some of the factors uh, related to manufacturing that companies would be looking at. And before I do this, I have to emphasize that I recognize the private sector does a lot of bad things. But at the same time, there are a lot of organizations that are trying to do good things as well. I happen to be a person who works with companies that are trying to do the right things. So I'll talk a little bit about what we do and how we do it. Um, and, you know, when you play or in this playground with companies that are either an environmental or social side and you want to do things, you have to make a choice whether you are on the naming and shaming side or whether or not you're on the let's help these companies side. We happen to pick the helping the company side because there is nobody else really doing it. And so that's the side that we uh, basically decided to work with. So with manufacturing, you have supply chains. This is a typical supply chain for a running shoe. You would have tier one where you actually assemble the running shoe. Tier two in, is where the rivets and the shoelaces and the zippers and the sole of the shoe and the textile comes from. Tier three is the raw material. The average company maybe that is selling shoes around the world will be doing audits, but only of tier one until recently. Now, because of the legislation, they have to go all the way down to the lowest tier. So uh, prior to uh, this change, they were doing 2,000 audits, but when you add tier two and three in there, now you're talking about six, seven, 8,000 audits. Who, who's going to pay for that? So what you're seeing is this transformation where companies that in the past would never share information about their suppliers are coming together and saying, we're using the same zipper company. You do the zipper audit, we'll do the shoelace audit, somebody else does a rivet of it. And as a result of that process, you're seeing this exchange of information. And basically what they're looking for are indicators of forced labor, which are indicators of modern slavery. 
there's there's 11 of these indicators. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I'll give you a couple of examples. But basically, the audits are trying to determine whether there's abuse of vulnerability or deception or isolation. All of these things are relevant to, to auditors, and this is what they do when they're looking at a particular company. So let me give you a concrete example. So there's a villager in Nepal. He's in a fairly remote area. He makes around 50 US dollars a month. He's never going to make any more than that and not enough to really thrive. Recruitment agent from the capital cap and goes to him and says, hey, brother, how would you like to make 250 US dollars? You're not really doing well on with $50,000. I says, wow, that sounds great. What do I need to do? Well, you need to come with me to cap and sign some papers. We'll get you a passport, train you, get your plane tickets, send you to Malaysia. You'll make all this money. Oh, wait, there's one other thing. You have to give us 1,500 US dollars. Guy says, I'm poor. I don't have any money. The recruitment agency says, don't worry about it. We'll get somebody to lend the money. It is no problem. We'll, we'll sort that out for you. So he signs an agreement, not realizing the fees and the interest rates being excessive. By the time he gets from his village to Kathmandu, it goes from 1,500 to 3,000. By the time he makes it to Malaysia, it's $4,500. So he ends up working several years just to pay back the debt that he has, not sending any money home. And as a result of that, he is forced to stay in that job until the debt is paid. That's called that bondage. And it's an indicator of modern slavery. Another thing that happens is that when he's in Nepal, he signs a contract in, in Nepalese. Um, and, you know, he, he, if he can't read, somebody reads it to him. He just knows what the contract says. When he gets to Malaysia, they give him another contract. It's in a foreign language. He says, well, I, I don't know what it says. They say, sign it. I don't know what to say. sign it, or we're going to send you back. You lose everything. Signs the contract, and it basically cheats him. Has all kinds of additional fees if he doesn't meet targets. So he's not really making 250 US dollars a month. He's actually making 125. And again, that's being used to pay back the recruitment fees. Another thing that happens when he gets there, they take away his documentation and they say they need it for visas, but he doesn't get it back. So let's say after two years, he says, I've had enough. I don't care about anything. I'm going home. Give me my uh, passport. Manager says, no. What do you mean, no? Give me my passport. No. You said you're going to be here four years. You can stay four years. Guy says, I'll go to the police and tell them you won't give it back to them. Guy laughs and says, well, who do you think they're going to believe? We'll say we don't have it. You don't have your, pass uh, your uh, documentation. You're in a foreign country. They're going to put you in a remand center, eventually send you to jail. Uh, nine months later, they'll send you back, you lose everything. So these are just three indicators of what, what's actually happening within private companies. And these are the types of things that auditors are looking for. In order to address this, companies are doing all kinds of things. One of the things they're doing is setting up all kinds of policies, both internal and external policies that basically say we have zero tolerance to forced labor. And these policies basically cascade down their supply chains in the contract language to their suppliers and sub suppliers that say, if you work with us, basically you can't do anything related to modern slavery. A lot of training is taking place. Entire brands are being trained on this topic. I, I do this on a regular basis. And their suppliers are being trained and their sub, sub suppliers are being trained in the local language to make sure that they understand this. The idea is that if everyone knows what this topic is, it's hard to basically have it take place. Audits that used to superficially go in and identify forced labor are going deeper into the issue. They're asking questions. They're going onto the factory floor. They're interviewing the workers. They're bringing in um, you know, uh, translators when they can in order to collect the information. And that allows them to ensure that this isn't occurring. Another thing that's happening is corporations, big brands are going to the factories and saying, do you have any indebted people there? You say you don't? Okay, prove to us that you don't. If you do, you have to pay those debt yourself. And that's all. And, and, and once you prove that you've done that, then we can work with them. And the reason why the brands are doing this is because they recognize that if they don't do that, and somebody, an investigative journalist finds out that they're working with a particular factory that has that indebtedness, it's a modern slavery indicator and they can get into a lot of trouble. Lastly, a lot of the new legislation says that corporations have to go all the way down to the lowest level of their supply chains to ensure that workers have grievance mechanisms, whether it's apps or hotlines or suggestion box. They have to have something in place in order for that to happen. So this is kind of the transition that you're seeing take place within the manufacturing world. Why should the banks care about this? Well, it comes back to that number of $150 billion. 
if any of that money that's tainted by modern slavery gets into a legitimate bank, the bank gets fined for money laundering. For example, uh, there was a particular bank in Australia that was fined 1.3 billion Australian dollars because they allowed for online sexual exploitation of children to take place. That's a huge amount of money, but for them, it wasn't the money that was the problem. It had a tremendous impact on their reputation. You had a bank that for 100 years, Years was considered the good guy bank, all of a sudden having that emotional term of modern slavery next to it, it you created issues uh, for their reputation, it created naming and shaping in the media, and a tremendous loss of um, revenue as a result of that. So what the banks are basically doing is uh, developing systems and procedures to protect themselves. First thing they're developing are typologies. Typologies basically track what human trafficking crimes look like. Then they use that information to identify in, in accounting mechanisms what is potentially nefarious, what could be red flags for uh, you know, a particular crime. And then once they have those, those indicators, they put it next to big data. So let me go into these in a little bit more detail. This is a typical banking typology. So on the top, what you see is criminal activity and victim in the top uh, planes, you see the various steps that takes place. And then below, you look at various transactions that take place at different levels. Some of those transactions have a red flag next to it, which means that it is a possible indicator of modern slavery. When you collectively bring those red flags together and apply it to a particular business, you might find a pattern that identifies human trafficking. So as I mentioned, uh, forensic accounting does that. So let me give a typical example, and in fact, an example in the United States. So you had a Vietnamese nail salon chain, and that chain basically had hours from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. A, an accountant noticed that there were transactions in that same business at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, all around $200. Couldn't understand what was going on. When they looked into it, using these typologies and these red flags, they basically realized that there was a sex trafficking ring within the same business at, 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 at other hours. So the red flag indicators in this place are transactions after hours of around $200 um, with a particular type of business. When you take those factors and then you apply it to your data and you run the numbers, you might be able to find other examples of modern slavery there. So these are just two of the sectors that we work with. We work with hospitality, retail, we work with tech, we work with all different types of organizations. And these are the types of things that we help them with. So the organization that I run is called the Mekong Club. It's an NGO based in Hong Kong. We work with the private sector in a positive, supportive, non-naming and shaming way to help them to understand the issue of human trafficking. Um, you might ask, why would you call a organization that does this uh, the Mekong Club, my club? Well, when we were setting this up, HSBC, Standard Charter, Disney, H&M, a variety of organizations said that they needed an organization to work with them so that they understood what the issue is. But they told us right from the beginning to ensure that um, basically the uh, whatever you came up with as part of this process should not um, have human rights or human trafficking in the name because it would scare the private sector away. So the Mekong River goes through China and Southeast Asia. That was our playground for a long time. Club didn't mean anything, and that's the reason why we came up with that particular name. Uh, what we uh, do is we work with the banks. You heard the reason why the banks would be interested in this, retailers, manufacturers, hospitality sector. They have to be concerned about this because they have four factors. They have third-party contractors, people that are coming from other parts of the world. They have to make sure that those people aren't tainted by modern slavery. You have uh, construction that could be tainted by modern slavery. They buy seafood and furniture and supplies that could be tainted, and they have sex trafficking. So we work with hotels to help them to figure out what you do when a 55-year-old guy goes in with a 13-year-old girl at three o'clock in the morning in Bangkok, and we help them to develop protocols to, to uh, uh, assign some responsible people to see what is about to happen and to perhaps stop it. These are the types of things that we would be doing. We also basically assess all of the organizations that we work with. We have an automated um, baseline assessment, and out of 100, many of the organizations we work with usually get about 50%. That's because they may be doing auditing, but that's not enough. You have to make sure that you train people, you raise awareness, you have leadership understanding this, you have risk assessments, 
you have policies and procedures, you have remediation. In the absence of those things, you basically are falling short. Our community meets on a quarterly basis to debate and discuss and identify what needs to be done to address modern slavery. And that usually results in various tools being developed. So we developed about 35 different tools. This is an example of one of the tools. Uh, the retail group said that they wanted uh, e-learning. So instead of a 45 minute e-learning video, we came up with 15 three minute videos, it comes out to 45 minutes, bite-sized pieces, but it, it's in multiple languages, Mandarin, Burmese, Thai, because 90% of the information in out in the world related to human trafficking tends to be in English, but 90% of the people who need it don't speak English. So it's really important to have materials in local languages. Just one other tool, um, the uh, audit, the uh, manufacturing group said we need a, a tool that will allow auditors to go onto the factory floor and communicate with people who don't speak uh, the language that they do. Now, the auditors probably oftentimes don't even know where these people come from. So this particular tool is you have flags on the front, you get the worker to press the flag from where they come from. And then in their language, uh, uh, with headphones on, uh, the audio will say, we're going to ask you some questions. If the answer to the question is yes, press green, no, press red. Um, are you uh, being exploited? Do you have any issues or problems? Do you have indebtedness? Do you have access to your paperwork and so forth? This simple tool has increased um, basically a victim identification by about 25%. and allows for companies to ensure that they're not being uh, used. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just end with a, a couple of stories to, to kind of put into perspective my feelings of this as an activist. Uh, this particular story brings me back to my early days in Nepal. So, you know, 30 years ago, I desperately wanted to do something to address the issue of modern slavery. So I decided I was going to uh, write a book. As part of that process, I went to the shelters and interviewed the women and the girls. I went to one shelter and there was a girl named Gita. And every time I approached her, she said, no, 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 I don't want to give my story. But as I interviewed everyone else, she sat there and listened to everything that I said. When I finished and I was leaving that shelter, shelter, Gita comes running up and says, I changed my mind. You can have my story. I said, wow, that's great. So Gita sat on one side of the table, the rest of us on the other side of the table in over a three hour period. She really literally told the worst story I'd ever heard of rape and torture and disease and murder and betrayal. Honestly, I didn't know what to say to this girl. It was, it was the most horrific story. I'd heard lots of stories. It was the regular story times 10. I didn't know what to say. Finally, I turned to Gita after a long uh, delay and pause, and I said, wow, Gita, you must be so angry at the traffickers for the horrific things they did to you. She paused and paused. And she said, no, I'm angry at you and you and you. She pointed at us. She said, where were you? So that every single day she woke up praying for somebody to come and help her. Nobody came. But she went to school till she was 12. She knew that everything was right out in the open and it was illegal and nobody was doing anything about it. She said she wasn't angry at the traffickers. She said they're just bad people being bad people. She said she was angry at the good people, at society for allowing a 15-year-old girl to be commercially raped 7,000 times, only to eventually get AIDS and she was dying. Now, Gita pretty much called us all out because Gita understood that the 30,000 people like me working on this is insufficient to get above a uh, half percent. She recognized that the only way for this to change is to have the world step up and basically say this is unacceptable. So usually when in, I'm in front of an audience, let's say there's 100 people, I say if I could get each of you to do one thing to address modern slavery, that's one times 100. If I do 100 presentations to 100, that adds up to a lot of people. So often people come to me and say, well, what is it that we can do? Well, one thing you can do is learn about this. Guess what? You just did your one thing. You learned about it through this uh, presentation. You don't have to do anything else. You've done your one thing. How easy was that? But if you go and tell another person and another person what you, you, you heard, or if you tell your kids what you heard, each time you do that, you're adding to the collective understanding of this particular topic. You can basically be a responsible consumer. Before you go online, look to see whether or not a, a, a company has a policy related to human trafficking. If they do, congratulate them. If they don't, say, listen, I like your product. I'd feel better if you had that. Many companies respond to, to this type of thing. You can basically volunteer. 
Uh, we have about 75 volunteers that we have. The, some are comms people or human uh, resource people or bankers and students. It doesn't matter. In fact, my youngest uh, volunteer is nine years old or was nine years old. This, one, this girl saw me in a documentary, contacted me and said, Mr. Friedman, you know, I saw a documentary on human trafficking. It's a terrible thing. I want to help. I said, you're nine years old. She said, so what? I said, you're nine years old. She said, nine-year-olds are the new 16-year-olds. Give me an opportunity. So I asked her, well, what is it that you can do? I said, I can find anything on the internet. So I had had a couple of second-year Yale Law students as interns. They couldn't find a bunch of stuff I was looking for. I gave it to her. Two days later, she had everything. The point is that she had an inherent skill. That was her thing. Every one of us has a particular talent. It could be public speaking, it could be writing, it could be fundraising, it could be organizing, it could be selling t-shirts. It doesn't matter. You add your skill to whatever it is, the volunteerism, and it really does make a difference. Or you can donate. There's, uh, a, you know, at this particular time, post-COVID, I worked with 750 organizations, 25% of them don't exist anymore because they didn't survive COVID. They couldn't keep their activities going. The fundraising wasn't there. Donating a certain amount of money to a local organization that's fighting this particular uh, situation really does add up. My last story or set of stories deals with the role of the private sector. Now, you know, a lot of people think that the private sector is inherently evil. Uh, and as I say, there, there are elements of the private sector that is evil, but I happen to work with a lot of people that really kind of care about the world and want to do the right thing. So this story uh, happened right before COVID. I was uh, at a big conference in the United States. Uh, it was uh, American Banking Association conference. I did a presentation. At the end, this guy comes up and says, I want to tell you a story. You know, as a public speaker, that happens on a regular basis. Go ahead. What's your story? He said he was taking his daughter and his wife, his teenage daughter, from one part of the United States to another. They were driving. They got to the halfway point. They pulled him to a motel. He got his wife and daughter settled. He was going out for food, and he saw this 14-year-old girl being dragged into a room. It looked like it was prostitution. She was so young. I have a teenage daughter, he said. It really bothered me. So I went to the manager of the motel, and I said, this is what I saw. He then back, went back to his room, and he's kind of peeking out of the, the window to see what's going on and didn't know if anything would happen. But sure enough, the police came. And uh, 15 minutes later after that, this guy's being taken out in handcuffs. So the girl's being taken away in an unmarked car. And he came up and he said, I needed to tell somebody this story because this is a milestone in my life. I've really, really helped these people. And, and, and I feel so good about it. So I looked at this guy and he says, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a banker. And I said, yeah, I get that. You're in a banking conference. But what do you do? He said, well, I do anti-fraud and, you know, look at uh, typologies and try to identify, you know, criminal activities, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, do you deal with human trafficking cases? He said, yeah, all the time. What do you do? Well, when we think there's a suspicious case, we send a suspicious transaction report to the police and, you know, then they basically take care of it. So I looked at this guy and he said, dude, don't you realize that by you doing your job to protect the bank and giving those suspicious activity reports to the police, Maybe every time you do that, the same thing happens. You may not see it in person, but it's also helping to address this particular issue. You're a hero. Did you not realize that? So he kind of tilted his head like a cocker spaniel, and they took him a few minutes. And then he said, yeah, you're right. By me basically protecting the bank, I'm protecting other people. I am heroic. So a couple of months later, I'm in Singapore. I'm on stage. There's 650 compliance bankers in the room. And I said to them, you guys basically do things to ensure that bad guys don't get away with things. And you address human trafficking. By you doing that, it's heroic. You should give yourselves a pat on the back. After that, I had about 40 people come up to me and say, well, nobody ever says that uh, about us. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, our, we're tired and, you know, nobody ever says good things about it. But you're right. By us doing our job, we're making the world a better place. I say the same thing about the auditors that work in manufacturing. I looked at Chinese factories 30 years ago, and I look at them now, and they're so much better because of those regular audits that each individual thing that they found was fixed and fixed and fixed. As a result of that, the private sector has played a role in addressing issues like modern slavery. They have played a role in making the world a better place, but they often don't get credit for it. With that, uh, these are a couple of my books. One of them deals with um, volunteerism, the be here, be the change. It makes a case for the fact that we should all do volunteerism based on what makes our heart sing. Another book is uh, related to human trafficking. 
these books are sold to raise money to allow me to do these types of talks. Uh, if you're interested, they're available on Amazon. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much.